Amen. Amen. One more time, let's give God a hand for our children and our families and for all of you. You may be seated. As you're seated, I want to share with you that um, this week during the time that I would um, normally have been uh, doing sermon preparation on Tuesday, I was kind of uh, rushing my way to the airport to try to catch a man that I would consider a friend, um, and uh, his name's Scott, and the reason I wanted to get to Scott is that Scott was getting on a plane to fly out of Myrtle Beach to fly to Texas uh, to be with his mother and there to hope to get into MD Anderson um, uh, Cancer Treatment Center uh, because he had a recurrence of a very aggressive cancer, and basically they had found cancer kind of like everywhere and he was hurting, and he was in a, in a rough spot. And somebody that, that loves him and cares for him told me that Scott's very scared. And uh, as, uh, as this person shared that Scott was scared, um, he was afraid of dying. And the fear of, of death was really gripping him. Um, and I wanted to get there. Now, now, now how many people, um, I was looking at Christmas decorations on the way there and all that stuff. And, and so... So I'm picturing him in Texas, and there's going to be all the, the tinsel and the bells and all that kind of stuff, and he's going to be going to a cancer treatment center. How many people ever feel like something just feels wrong about that? Just feels kind of out of place. You know what I'm saying? How many people have ever known someone who lost a loved one near Christmas? Has anybody ever known that kind of experience? And you kind of think, God, oh, this is just not right. Um, and so we've been talking about rethinking church and rethinking who we are and who Jesus is and who he's called us to be. And at the same time, we started thinking about rethinking Christmas. So I want you to rethink Christmas, and I want you to rethink it in such a way that it might be that actually right now is probably the perfect time for Scott to face what he's facing because Christmas reminds us of why Jesus came. And when it reminds you of why he came, the power of that for what Scott is going through is unimaginable. So I want you to take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 14. John chapter 14, we're going to start in verse 1. We're going to go all the way through verse 23. John 14, 1 through 23. But before we get into it, as you're looking for John, it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the fourth book in the New Testament. Um, and as you look for that, um, I want to go ahead and tell you that I'm going to... I'm going to share a lot of scriptures with you, and I'm going to share the references for those scriptures, but don't even worry about writing them down. The sermon will be online by 2 o'clock today, and you can go back and listen through the sermon and grab those scriptures and look them up and search them. And so, so I'm just giving you the references so you'll know where to find them later. But if you'll stay right there in the book of John chapter 14, you're going to hear um, the core of everything we're saying is found right there in John 14, 1 through 23. That sound good? So, so here's the deal. Here's the deal, is that Jesus at this point in John chapter 14, he has already predicted that he's going to die. And so he's talking about death to his disciples, and his death was going to be a pretty tough death. Um, and with that, he then says in verse 1, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe, believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come back to take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. And then he said to them, you know the way to the place where I'm going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered in verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so Jesus was making them fully aware. You don't need to fear death. You don't need to fear your own death, my death. The truth is, is that I'm preparing a place for you in heaven, and death has no power, and I am the way and the truth and the life. I'm the one that overcomes the power of death, and through me you're going to have life, and you don't have to fear anything in that process. And so if you look in the book of Hebrews in chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, it says this, that because we, the children, are human, that Jesus took on humanity so that through his death, he would break the power of the one who has the power of death, and that is the devil, and that he would set us free from the slavery that we've been held in by our fear of death for our whole lives. And so he's saying, look, for those who have fear of death, for those who have been held in slavery to that fear of death, maybe for your whole life, if there's anybody here who fears death, 
And sometimes people get panic attacks over the thought of death or people just don't want to think about death because death scares them. He's saying, look, Jesus came in the flesh to offer his body as a, as a sacrifice for sin, to take away the power of death, to set you free from the fear of death so that you could just have peace knowing that you have life. Now, now this was kind of spoken to as, as the Lord sent an angel to speak to Joseph when, when he was pledged to be married to Mary. And he said, Mary's going to have a baby, but it's okay. You haven't been with her, but this baby's going to be from the Holy Spirit. And then he says this in verse uh, Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. Um, he tells Joseph, he said, you're going to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. So the reason that Jesus came was Jesus came so that, listen, I came, Jesus is saying, to help you to, to set you free from sin, to set you free from the fear of death, to make a way for you to be with the Father eternally in heaven, and I am just going to completely set you free in that, and I'm going to overcome the power of death. I'm going to save you from your sin. And so a pastor uh, that I have a lot of respect for wrote it this way. It was pretty eloquent the way that he said it um, in a sermon, but in the sermon he said this, Jesus was born to die. And, and then he said the only reason that he was a baby was so that he could grow to be a man and that he could die for our sins. And then he said, those soft little hands that were knit together in Mary's womb were knit together so that one day nails might be driven through them. And then he said, and those chubby little feet, um, pink and never having walked, would one day walk up a hill and be nailed to a cross. And then he said, that, that sweet little head... Um, with those sparkling eyes and that eager mouth and those cute little ears, that it was formed so that one day men would crush a crown of thorns into uh, that head. And that little body, um, soft and warm and, and wrapped in swaddling clothes, he said, would one day be torn open by a spear revealing a broken heart. And that's the only reason that God made that body. Jesus was born to die. Now that, that as, as, again, this guy I respect a lot, he said, he said, that's the core reason why Jesus came. Because then for all of us who are held captive and in slavery to the fear of death could be set free from that because all of our sin and all of our mess and all the things that would cause us to even fear death, that Jesus lived a perfect life and came and gave his life by the will of the Father as a sacrifice for our sins, and you and I can be completely free of that fear of death. And, and so I wanted to get to Scott, and I wanted to say, Scott, man, I, I want to make sure that you don't have fear of death. I want you to know that Jesus came, and he went to a cross for you, and he, and he bled and died. That's the reason he came, was to give his life for you so that you could not fear death anymore. And, and so John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. I, I want you to know that God wants you to have eternal life. And he's paid that price for you. And then 1 John 5, 11 and 12 says this. This is the testimony. God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. And then he writes in verse 13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. So Jesus came so that, so that you and all those that you love were they to come and receive that amazing gift of his grace and the sacrifice that he made for us and surrender our lives to him that we could be rid of the fear of death. We could know that we have eternal life. He came for that reason, but, but I feel like when my, when my brother expressed it that way by saying the only reason he came to die, he said the only reason for Bethlehem was so that there could be a Calvary. The only reason that he was born was so that he might die, and these, these little hands were only born to take those uh, nails. Um, I believe that, that he missed something in that. He did come to die. Jesus did come to give his life, but he came for way more than just to give his life. He wasn't born just to die. If he was born just to die, he could have lived a short time and then been killed while he was still perfect, then everything would be okay. But the reality is, is that he came for far more than that. In fact, right after the, the angel had said to Joseph, you're going to name him Jesus because he's going to save his people from their sins, in Matthew chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, it says, all this happened in order to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, 
the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. They will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. You see, the truth is, is that Jesus wasn't born just to pay the price and just to save us from our sins in the sense of saying, I'm going to pay the price for your sins, you're going to be forgiven. But he came to reveal the heart of the Father. He came so that we could have relationship with the Father. And so when Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me, he wasn't just talking about nobody gets to heaven except through me. He's saying nobody comes into relationship with the Father except through me. And so Jesus was not saying, I'm just the way to heaven. He's saying, I'm the way to relationship with the Father. And so the next verse, verse 7 of chapter 14, if you're reading there in the book of John, he says this. He says, if you really know me, you will know my father also or as well. And then he, he says, look, from now on, you do know me and have seen me. He's saying, look, through me, you're going to know the father. And through me, you're going to see the father. You're going to know the, you're going to know the God you've desired to know. You're going to know him through me. Well, Philip said to him this in, in verse 80. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. In verse 9, Jesus replied by saying, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you for such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? He said, don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that, that I say to you, I don't speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing His work. Believe me when I say that the Father is in me and I am in, in Him, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. So get a picture of what Jesus was saying to Philip. you got to get it. It's so powerful. He's saying, Philip, you already know God. You've already seen God. Because in me, you have seen him. And Philip's starting to get it. Wait a minute. When we saw Jesus' love, we saw the love of God, literally. We saw Jesus' compassion. We were seeing the compassion of God. When we saw Jesus touch people and heal people and feed people, we were watching the very power of the hand of God at work. When we heard him speak, we were hearing God speak. When we were in his presence, we were in the presence of God. As we walked with him, we were getting to know the heart of God. As we got to know Jesus and came to know him, we were getting to know God. And we were in relationship with God. Moreover, we were comforted. When we were comforted by Jesus, we were comforted by God. When we were rebuked by Jesus, we were rebuked by God. When we were encouraged by Jesus, we were encouraged by God. When, when he walked with us, God was walking with us. So they, all of a sudden, the whole paradigm shifts, and all of a sudden, Philip's realizing, man, this whole time, it's been God. And so the reason that, that the Father sent Jesus, the reason he sent him was not just to die, it was to live. He did as much through his living as he did through his dying. And in his living, he was bringing us to the heart of the Father. And he was saying, I want you to know the Father and you can know him through me. And so those hands were not born only to be nailed to a cross. Those hands were to demonstrate the power and the love and the goodness of the Father. That makes sense? And so those eyes were, were born to see as the Father, see those ears to hear as the Father heard. Those, that mouth was born to speak the very words of the Father. Those feet, he, they were made so that he could walk with others and lead them. And so Jesus' body was not just a body to be killed, it was a body to live. Do you get that? It was a body through whom the Father would live and they would get to know the heart of the Father and know him in reality. How many people get this? All of a sudden, Philip's realizing, you mean this whole time, God, the God of a 14 billion light year universe, the God who spoke creation into order, the God that the Bible says all of heaven cannot contain him, the God who lives in unapproachable light, this God has been with me? And he has comforted me and he has encouraged me and he has loved me and he has spoken to me and he has taught me. Oh my, oh my God, thank you, right? So how many people go like, oh, how cool would that be? 
Who has ever wanted that? You know what I'm saying? Like, like well, if only God would just like be like right there in relationship with me. Um, I remember a, a, a parent talking about they had a child who was saying, Mommy, stay in the room with me. And she said, Baby, you're going to be okay. God's with you. And, and she started out of the room. He said, Please come back, Mommy. She said, God's with you, baby. And, and the child just responded by saying, Tonight I need a God with skin on him. <laughs> right? Anybody ever felt like you need a God with skin on him, right? And, and, and the reality is, is that Jesus was God with skin on him. Jesus was, Jesus was the exact representation of his being, sustaining everything by his powerful word. This Jesus, guys, that Philip realized and, and Thomas realized and all the disciples realized, we've been with God. And we have come to know God through knowing Jesus in that place. And so you would think right there, that would be like good news and great news, and it is. And it's like, but how many people could say like, well, then why are you leaving? Anybody? You know what I'm saying? I mean, you're eternally like, like why are you leaving? And, and you know, so even if you go to the cross and you're resurrected, stay. Like, like why would you leave us now if, if, if you've been with us, I don't understand. And, and secondly, why are you leaving us? Like, why, why can't we go too now? Why are you going to come back for me? Just take me now. Anybody, you know, I mean, it's like, I, I, if, if we're going to get it, let's get it. And let's get it now. Well, Jesus begins to answer that question so profoundly in verse 12. He says, very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing. They will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And I'll do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Now, get, what, get what's happening here. Jesus is saying, Philip, hadn't you already seen that by what I was doing that the Father was in me? Wasn't it clear by that evidence of the works themselves that the Father was in me? And then he turns around and says to Philip, now, Philip, guess what? God's going to be doing in you what he's been doing in me and even greater things than what he's been doing in me. And so guess what? The very things that he's done in me, he's going to do in you and greater things. And I'm going to give you whatever you need to make that happen. And then in verse 15, he says, if you love me, keep my command, keep my commands. And I will ask the father and he'll give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever. The spirit of truth. You know what he's saying? Hey, man, I'm going to be sending you my Holy Spirit. Come on. Come on. I'm going to be sending you my Holy Spirit. He says, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. Do you get what he's saying? Jesus is saying, Philip, dude, I'm the one that's been living with you. And when I send my Holy Spirit, I'm coming to you. I am going to actually come to you. He said, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. He said, before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live, you also will live. And then he says, on that day, you will realize that I am in my Father and you are in me and I am in you. Listen, on that day, you realize I am in my Father and you are in me and I am in you. Take it back. You remember what Jesus was saying to Philip? Philip, don't you believe that I'm in the Father and the Father's in me? And don't you realize that everything you've seen has been the Father's love through me, the Father's power through me. You have met the Father in me. Now, Philip, guess what? People are going to meet me in you. Because just as I'm in the Father, now you're in me and I am in you, right? And as I'm in you, people are going to meet me through your love. They're going to be touched by you through your hands. They're going to be, they're going to experience me through you just like you have experienced the Father through me. Did anybody get that picture? What an awesome picture, right? Like he's saying, he's saying, Philip, does it make sense now why he's leaving? Of course he needed to leave. Because to that point, there was one set of eyes. There was one set of hands. There was, there was one set of feet, right? There was, there was one, one body through which the father would show his love. But he said, here's what's going to happen now. 
is I'm going to go to the Father and I'm going to come back to you in Holy Spirit and I am going to fill you with my love. I'm going to live in you as the Father has been living in me. I'm going to be doing work in you as the Father has been doing work in me. And through you, people are going to get to know me just like they got to know the Father through me. And so, Philip, now, guess what? It ain't going to be one set of eyes. It's going to be thousands and hundreds of thousands, ultimately millions of sets of eyes that God will use to see what needs to be done. It will be millions of hands and feet that God will use to reach out and touch people with the power of his love, to bring healing, to do the miraculous. God said there will be millions of voices to speak truth into the lives of people and speak words of encouragement. There will be millions of voices, and I will be in all of them. Oh, man, does anybody get, get, does that rock you to think about that? Right? Right? And then he says in verse 21, he says, whoever has my commands and obeys them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my father and I too will love them and show myself to them. He's saying, look, don't you realize that as you seek to obey me, I'm going to fill you and I'm going to show myself to you and it's just going to be a beautiful picture. Well, then Judas, not Judas Iscariot said, Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? These guys had walked with Jesus, right? And he's saying, now I'm going to be in you and I'm going to be with you and that's cool. And, Philip, and, and so, so Judas is saying, well, well, why are you showing yourself just to us and not to everybody else? And Jesus' response was to say, if anyone loves me, they'll obey my teaching. Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. You know what he's saying? He's saying, Philip, I'm not just doing this for you. I'm not just doing this in you. As you go, you're going to show other people my love, and they're going to meet me through you. But guess what? As soon as they decide to follow and obey me, I'm going to get in them too. I'm going to make my home with them too. They're going to know me, right? They are going to know me just as you know me. And then I'm going to start using them. What a powerful picture, right? And so I told you all a while back about Joe Aldrich. Um, uh, he was, there was a family reaching a whole lot of international students. And so around Christmas time, uh, they'd just see all, all kinds of kids coming to know Christ who were college students from other countries that were Muslim background and Buddhist background and, and uh, animist and others. And they were coming to faith in Christ. And he was asking, how are you doing this? And, and you remember what his answer was. This family's answer was to say this, we love them. See, we, when they're sick, we take them to the doctor, we feed them, we bring them over, we love them, we speak truth into their lives, we listen to them, we see what's going on in their lives. We just love them. He said, and in our love, they meet Jesus, even though they don't know who they've met yet. And then we introduce them to the one that they've met. How cool is that, right? How many people want to live like that? How many people want to be that person that would say, you know what? God has chosen to use me. He's chosen to use me. He said that anyone who believes in me, I'm going to do the works. You're going to do the very works that Jesus did and even greater things. He said, that's true. That's what's going to be true of every one of you. And I'm going to come and I'm going to live in you and I'm going to fill you and people are going to see my love through you and they're going to be comforted through your cut touch and through your caring and through your listening. They're going to be challenged through your words. They're going to be spoken. Truth is going to be spoken into their lives through your voice. I'm going to use you. And man, living like that, watch the impact of that and what it does to people around. And so as we've been talking as a church about God doing something in and through us that no building can contain. I just want you to think about this. Take one preacher and 10,000 people and one instrument through whom people are supposed to hear the voice of God, through whom people are supposed to hear God speak words of encouragement or rebuke or correction. One person, maybe a prayer team of 10 people who are going to lay hands on people and pray for them and, and ask God to do great things in their life, right? Right? One, one small group of people that are going to be giving glory to God. Imagine 10,000 people being ministered to and a handful of people doing the ministry. Or imagine what happens when, when about 300 people say, I'm going to be the instrument. When 300 people say, look, God is going to use me. And through me, people are going to meet Jesus. And through Jesus, they're going to meet the Father. 
And they're going to be given eternal life, and they're never going to have to fear death. And they're going to know the heart of the Father. And as they open up their hearts and choose to obey Him, He's going to make His home in them too. And then He's going to do it through them like He did it through me. And He's going to love through them like He's loving through me. And people are going to get to know Jesus through their love, just like they're getting to know Jesus through my love. Is that a cool plan? Because listen to this. His plan was this. His plan was he did not want to start an institution when he started his church. He did not want to put a place where people would go once a week when he started his church. He said, it's a gathering of people who are all connected to me and through me connected with each other. And this people will go out into every community, into every neighborhood, into every workplace, into every school. And wherever they are, I will have a set of hands through which to touch people, a a, a set of lips through which to speak truth and love. I will have... I will have hearts that are there for my love toward those people. I will have instruments through whom people can meet my love everywhere. That was a movement. That's the movement that God is doing, and no building can contain it, guys. It'll be absolutely everywhere, and God's called you to it. And so here's the question. The question is, is if we're going to be a part of that, and you and I are going to be a part of something that no building can contain, It's going to mean that every single person in here is going to be responsible for something. And I want to tell you what that something is. And I want to tell you exactly what you and I need to start with in our prayers. Jesus said, look, if you believe in me, how many people here believe in Jesus? Raise your hand if you believe in Jesus. Everyone who believes in me will do what I've been doing. And even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. He said, look, if you believe in me, you're going to do the things I've been doing. So how many people are ready for God to start doing in you the same things he did in Jesus, right? 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 And then he said, they'll do even greater things because I'm going to the Father, and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. So listen, I I want to tell you what I believe is the first thing we need to be asking. He said, I'll do whatever you ask of me. Whatever you ask of me, in order that I might bring glory to the Father, in order that people might meet me in you, and through me meet the Father, in order that you would be for others what I've been for you, I'll do whatever you ask. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to tell you what I believe you should ask for. I believe it's solid biblical. I believe that it actually grows out of the passage that we're in, that this is what you should be asking for. In case you're wondering... You'll never forget this if you don't want to forget it because every single day this church is going to be gathering together to pray. And the last thing we do every single day when we pray together is we're going to pray what I'm getting ready to tell you, okay? So if you want to live this out and you want to be those instruments, then you just simply get on our call every day. This week, we've been together. We had 50 people the first round, um, and it's been beautiful as we get together um, every morning, and it's at 5 and 6 a.m. And you know why we did that? Because people are getting up, and they're getting together and praying, and then they're spending time with God alone before they have to get their day started. Some are getting up and praying ahead of time and spending time with God and His Word and then coming together for that prayer time. It only lasts about 10 or 15 minutes, but we just get together and pray for each other. So here's the thing. This week, we're going to add 100 more people to it, and I hope that you'll be one of that 100 more people that you'll join in, and you'll just join with us on on every morning. And we do it at 5 and 6, and this week we start 7. Anybody glad about that, right? (laughs) Right, right? So so this week we start 7. So on your way out, people will be holding up a sheet of paper, and it's going to have the phone number that you call, and you plug in a number. It's a blast. You don't have to pray out loud. Uh, You can just get on and just listen and just pray in your heart. It's a great, great time. But here's what we're going to do every single day at the end of that time. We're going to pray these things. First thing that I believe that every believer ought to be praying according to what Jesus just said is this. He said, you're going to do the things that I'm doing and even greater. You're going to be an instrument for the Father's love and for my love just as I have been. And so with that being the case, the first thing we need to do is say, God, I want you to put in my heart what's in your heart. God, I want you to put in my heart what's in your heart. In the book of Romans chapter 5, verse 5, it says that the hope of being who God has called us to be does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Listen, if we don't have his love, if we don't have his heart, we're going to be good for nothing. Everybody agree? 
Everybody agree? And so when I offer myself to him and I give my heart to him, Jesus said there's a daily process of denying myself, taking up my cross, and following him. Every day, I want to say to God, how many people here would say to God every day, put in my heart what's in your heart? Every person I encounter, my cantankerous boss or my nagging wife or my whoever it is that I'm having to deal with, I want you to put your love into my heart for the people that I will engage with today. God, whether it be somebody who's been evil to me or somebody who's in need, I pray that you would put in my heart what's in your heart all day long. Anybody up for that prayer? Raise your hand if you're up. If you Come on. And so we will do that every single morning. That'll be the last thing we, we begin to pray, these things. So one, ask for him to put in your heart what's in his heart. Second is this. Ask him to put in your mind what's in his mind. Ask him to put into your mind what's in his mind. Now, now listen, here's the truth. Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9 says this. God says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my thoughts higher than your thoughts, my ways than your ways. There's, there's no way that you can think on his level. Agreed? So when we say, God, I want you to put your thoughts, I, I want to put into my mind what's in your mind. We're not saying I want to be equal to God and I want to think on his level. What we're saying is, is God, I want to think like you. I want what you think to be what comes to my mind when I engage situations. I want you to give me your mind so that I can discern what is best. You remember this, in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, he says this, don't conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. How many people would like to start seeing things the way God sees it, right? Instead of seeing it with my own selfish, greedy, you know what I'm saying, my own kind of like self-serving motives and all that junk, what if my mind were like the mind of Christ? This is said in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16, and you'll be able to look that up later. But in 1 Corinthians 2, 16, it says, Who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? Nobody. Nobody's known the mind of the Lord in that way, but he says, but we have the mind of Christ. But we have the mind of Christ. He's saying, he's saying, look, we can see things the way he sees things. We can think about things the way he thinks about things. We can say to him, put into my mind what's in your mind and begin to view life completely differently. Anybody get that picture? How many people here would like to have the mind of Christ? Anybody? The mind of Christ. You would like to have the heart of the Father and the mind of Christ. Oh, God, come on. I want that in my life. We're going to pray for that every single day. Who's in? Anybody in to do that? We're going to pray that every single day. Put in my heart what's in your heart. Put in my mind what is in your mind. I want the mind of Christ continually within my life. But then there's a last piece that we're going to do every single day, and that is to say to him, having, having asked you to put your love and, and put your, your heart into my heart and, and what's in your mind into my mind, then we're going to say to him, God, and now I offer my body to you as a living sacrifice. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says, In view of God's mercy, in view of his love and his mercy and his grace for you, he went to a cross to die for you. He did all that to take away the fear of death. He did what he did for you. He's loved you enough to come into relationship with you. In view of his mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. This is, this is your reasonable response to that kind of love. How many people would say to God, God, I want you to take these hands these feet, these lips, these eyes, these, th th these, eyes, these ears. I, I want you to take this mouth. I want you to use it. I want you to fill it and use it. I want to just offer myself to you, and I want to be an instrument of your love as much as Jesus was an instrument of your love. Right? Cool thought, right? And so, so listen to this. Romans chapter 6, verse 13 says this. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. Anybody here ready to say, God, I offer you my eyes. I want to see everything exactly like you see it today. Anybody, how cool would that be? I want to see what you see. 
Because in my heart and my mind and the way I've seen things, I see things and I miss what you see, God. But I want to see what you see. When there's somebody who's in need of love and encouragement, let me see what you see, right? Anybody want to do that? God, I offer my eyes to you that I would see what you see all day long. I offer my ears to you that I would hear what you hear. Because sometimes what we hear is offensive or what we hear is, is, is repulsive or what we hear makes us defensive but what about having the ears of God to hear what's actually going on in the hearts and lives of people who are speaking, right? How cool would it be to have his ears? Anybody here would say to him, God, I give you my ears. I want to hear like you hear, right? I want to see what you see. I want to hear what you hear. How many people would say, my mouth? This morning we were talking in our prayer time about the book of James and about how our mouths can be used to praise God and then to curse people. It's like, no way. How many people would say, God, I want these lips. I offer them to you today. I offer this voice to you today that you would speak through me your words and your truth. Do you know that God will do it? He said, I'll do whatever you ask, whatever you ask. And so do you know that he will give you spiritual gifts like the spiritual gift of encouragement, the spiritual gift of prophecy, that you'll be able to speak into people's lives the very words that they need to hear from God how many people have you ever seen somebody going through a struggle and you think, man, I really wish I could get Pastor Steve to talk to them because he probably has some good things to say. You know what I'm saying? I mean, like, or I need to give him a sermon to listen to, or I need to give him, God saying, not, not us, you, you. God can give you the things that they need to hear. He can give you the words of encouragement, you the words, maybe sometimes even of correction, but, but words that are words of life. How many people would just offer your voice to him and say, God, having given me your mind and put your heart in my heart, I offered you my lips, and if you give me the words, I'll speak them. Anybody besides me? What? Anybody besides me? Thank you, right? Thank you. Come on, right? Our voices. And sometimes that's going to be to your, your own children. Sometimes it's going to be your neighbors. It's going to be people all around you. And guess what? Your voice will mean more to them than any other voice they could possibly hear because through you, they will hear the voice of God if you will simply offer your lips to him as that living sacrifice. Agreed. Amen? Amen? So we're going to offer ourselves. How about if you say, God, would you use my hands? Would you use my hands? And so, Lord God, would you do through me the very things that you did with your hands? And so when you see somebody who's in need and maybe they're sick or, or maybe they're limping or something's going on, how many people are like, man, that person looks bad. We need to call a pastor to talk to them and pray with them. And You know what I'm saying? Or, or we can call the church and say, somebody needs to pray for this person. How many people would just say, no, I can put my hand on them and I can pray for them. I believe in him. And if I believe in him, he'll do through me the very things that he did, Right? So how many people could just say, God, use my hand, right? How about, how about God use my prayers and use my voice? Let, let me be the one. And how about when you see a need? How many people call the church? Oh, this person's in trouble. Let's call the church to see if the church can help. How about we help, right? How about we help? How about we step out and we say, God, now these hands and these feet and with my brothers and sisters in the body, we're going to do whatever you have done. We're going to do it ourselves. We offer our hands to you, Right? I offer my feet to you to go wherever you want me to go. How many people, how, how would it change your day if you were really asking the question, God, where do you really want me to be? You know what I'm saying? Do you really want me to stop by the place I'm getting ready to stop by, or would you rather have me somewhere else? Do you really want my feet right now at this time of day? I believe he believes in lazy boys and stuff like that. God, God wants us to rest. But right now, should my feet be propped up in this lazy boy watching something on TV that is definitely not giving me the mind of Christ? Or do you want me to throw that lever down, step up out of that chair, and go somewhere to somebody who might need to experience your love? Right? Now, everybody got it? Anybody here ready to say to God on a daily basis, God, I want you to put in my heart what's in your heart. I want you to put in my mind what's in your mind. I want to offer every part of myself to you as an instrument of righteousness. And I want you to love through me and touch through me and heal through me and speak through me. I want you, God, to use me so that other people will meet you in me. Right? And once they've met you, I'm going to introduce them to the one. Right? 
Because through you, they're going to get to know Jesus. And through Jesus, they're going to get to know the Father. And through the Father, they're going to have life, right? And now, now, I want to give a great example of this. And I'm going to ask for Deb Kithianis to come up here. Um, because, guys, this happens all the time. This is not, y'all, this isn't, this is what Christianity is. This is what Christianity is. This is what the church is. This is what we do. This is what we live. Church is not a place that you go to an hour every week. It's who you are every second of every minute of every hour of every day forever and ever. Right? Right? It's who we are. And when you and I live it, it touches people's lives. And so, Deb, I asked her if she would share. She just, she, you ever need God with skin on him, Right? And she was in a place of needing God with skin on him. And so I want you to kind of just share that. So, uh, oh. I forgot to turn it on. I'm so sorry. Yes. So in June, my husband died from pancreatic cancer. Um, and the last day that uh, I was, that we did anything, we were at Jess Sagan's house for a birthday party for him. And I hadn't been back in that room, even though I had been just to Jess's house probably 20 times. We had praise and worship rehearsal at Jess's, and I sat in the room, and I saw Margot and Jess standing in the same place, and I lost it. And I couldn't finish rehearsal. I just kind of sat there, and Jonathan said, it's okay, it's okay, Deb. Um, and I get a text message. Now I'm not going to cry. I did not cry the first time. From someone, and they said, Deb, you're special, and your family's special, and we want to help you. And I had been sitting in this place of desolation, um, feeling really alone. Uh, I couldn't go to church for a couple months. It was too hard. Every time I went to walk into the door, uh, this great thing about being here, it's a new place. It's easier. Um, but it's hard when you lose somebody. And you know, you're too young to, you, to be alone, you think, and everything. But um, she said, you're special. and. Would you make us a list, like a wish list of your needs, of your wants? And I just kind of lost it, honestly, and was really sad and really happy all at the same time because I think it's Isaiah 38, maybe 43, um, 19. It says that God will make rivers in the desert. And what happened is he made rivers of love out of my desolation. Yeah. And all because of some wonderful people that just stepped out. And so they've come to my house. They've helped me get rid of some of his things that I don't need to have in my house. They helped clean my house. They painted my bathrooms. Aww. They did my yard work. Um, and they've loved on me. I get text messages and phone calls daily. I get support daily and nobody told them as far as I know they just reached out and yeah. that's God and that's what God has done in my life amen amen <laughs> right and so um Deb was sharing that and the last thing she shared with me when she was talking about it she said you know out of all the stuff that they did, she said they did so many nice things. Um, and we got to, y'all, we got to love in action and in truth, right? Like serving and caring and, and providing. Um, but she said the thing that, that meant so much to me was they invited me to be a part of their C group. And she said, and now I'm in relationship with them and they're in relationship with me. Is that a cool thing, right? Right? <laughs> And so it's not like, come in and let's do something and feel good about ourselves and leave. It's come in and, and being a part of somebody's life and helping them walk it out. And she said, they actually brought me back to God. How cool is it? How cool is it when somebody can be an instrument through, that God uses to bring someone back to God? And so, so when it came to Scott, I was, I was sitting there thinking, I want Scott to know about e eternal life. And I want him to know about the gift of, of God through his son, Jesus but he has to get to know the heart of the Father and, and the heart of Jesus. He has to see that love, right? And so I'm thinking, man, he needs comfort, right? 
And God's saying, here's, here's a body I can use, right? You know, here's an arm I can throw around him. He needs some words spoken to him just that somebody cares. And here's some lips that can speak those words, right? And so, God, offer myself to you. Would you put into my heart what's in your heart for Scott? Would you put into my mind what's in your mind for Scott? Would you use these lips? Would you use these hands? Would you use this life to love him? How many people want... How many people are ready to just say, God, I'm like all in. I'm all in. I'm just ready right now. I'm ready to say, God, um, I'm ready to, to offer my body as a living sacrifice to you. I want to be your instrument, right? And so here's what we're going to do is, is I want you to remain seated unless, and this is real important, remain seated. Do not get up during worship until and unless you're a place where you're extremely serious about this, where you're seriously committed to saying, I am going to be an instrument for the love of Jesus that people can meet Jesus through me just like Jesus was an instrument of the Father that people could get to know the Father through him. I'm going to be an instrument of his love and I'm going to introduce people to Jesus by allowing him to put his love into my heart, put into my mind what's in his mind. I'm going to offer my body to him as a living sacrifice. I'm going to say I offer every part of me as an instrument of righteousness. Use my lips. Let me see what you see. Hear what you see. I mean, hear what you hear. Let me, let me reach out and touch with your power, God. I want, I want you to do through me, God, what you did through your son, Jesus. And if you're willing to do that, I'm going to ask you to stand during this worship time. But don't rush to that. Just whenever you really feel conviction in your heart. And, and I want you to understand this. This is not one day. This is every day. Today we're going to add another. We probably have enough to add every person in this room if you want to. We were going to add um, we actually have a couple of hundred opportunities to add new spaces on those daily prayers. We're going to do it at 5, at 6, and at 7. And every single day, as we pray over other things and we go through our scripture reading each day, we're reading through the Bible together. Um, all of you who want to be a part of that can, and it's on our website. We're just reading through the Bible, and then together we're praying and we're just sharing. Um, it's, you're going to love it. But at the end of that prayer, every single day at 5, at 6, and at 7, we're going to pray this prayer we talked about today. And we're going to go out into this world as his instruments. He's going to do it through you. So if you are committing to that, not just today, but every day. Not just every day, but every second of every minute of every day. Right? Forever and ever. God, I'm, I'm yours. Then we're going to invite you to stand as we worship.